<laughs> I call this my uh, formal Hawaiian. <laughs> it's kind of like a cross between Southern Cal, Hawaii, and what happens when the middle of winter is warm. Sort of. I like my stick. This is a object lesson for today's devotion. It's called my theological stick. Stick. This is my stick. Oi. <laughs> I have to smile because I'm thinking of this subject and I know that I'm going to get people pissed off <laughs> about their pet projects. <laughs> But since I grew up in the Jesus movement, and I did study theology, and I did study hermeneutic, soteriology, pneumology, her, uh, you name it, homiletic, you, you shoot. Every theological ology that you want to talk about, not only did I write about, not only did I study, I also argued about. So, been there, done that, let's get real. <laughs> and not only that, but I went to live in Jerusalem, and I lived there for 14 months, and I used to go down to Machniyuda and argue with the Talmudim that were studying coming out of yeshiva, you know, the yeshiva students, and we would de debate, <laughs> right, <laughs> argue, about aspects of Torah, and it was fun. I mean, the mindset and the logic and the detail and the nth degree with which you can go down to logic, you know, and get to the really gist of it, you know, especially with young people that are Jewish, that are studying and that's all they do is study, study, study. Wow, man, I was like wide open, brought alive and that's kind of why <laughs> when it comes to theology I'll eat you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Theology is such a waste of time. Uh, you know, I mean, that's what devotional is going to be about with, with Tozer, you know, no offense to you people that really love theology, but theology is just a stick. You use it to beat somebody with. That's all. It's not really going to profit you much. It's going to validate your feelings of faith, where if you actually need to program your mind to think that you need to prove to yourself that your mind is okay because somehow you've got to renew your mind according to the uh, theological premise, then I guess you need an education to open up and expand the horizons. But frankly, science fiction could do that for you a whole lot better than the reality of theology because you only need a Bible. Just read it. Accept it what it says and do it. Pretty simple. Man, I have argued so many points of view with all of these theologians and people that are talk about theology and you know try to argue and use their own terminology to come back at me and I throw back their own terminology, but I eat them with their own statements. It's like how simple can it get? And then the bottom line is you bring the person always back to their premise, and their premise is wrong because they're always trying to make a point that they have to add something of their opinion, which is usually what a theologian will do. They will not go with just the simple truth of Scripture. They have to prove themselves and adapt their own idea about what the Scripture says and then use that as a premise which they won't admit in the beginning that it's an idea. And then you challenge their premise from the very beginning that it's just an idea, and you can prove that they're false, that they created a fallacy all the way down through their outline of the theological premise that they had in the beginning. Do you understand all that? Of course not. But you see, Jesus did something that was phenomenal in his day to all the theologians of his time and era, which were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the lawyers of the law and the doctrine and all these things. He flat out hit it where it hat, hit it where it happens in the heart. Hit it where it happens in the heart. Hit it where it happens in the heart. Ooh. Hit it where it happens in the heart. Ooh. Too much caffeine? Okay. What he did was. He said, based upon a point of law, you have heard it said, and they all have heard it said, because people were teaching it at the time, so he'd pick some popular subject, and he would say, but I say unto you, 
the personal reality of God speaking was there. He was demonstrating that there was a personal conversation going on between him and the people that he was telling them what he said. How he was establishing his priority in that given situation. This isn't circumstantial referencing, although some people may try to you know, identify that as such, but this is called interpersonal relationship identification by way of the Holy Spirit application to your individual situation. Meaning that when you find yourself in a set of circumstances, like today, wherever you are, wherever you are, God will speak to you. See, that's the individual part. He will speak to you and direct you. That's, again, personal. You're where you're at. He will direct you. He will tell you the words to say because he said he would. Doesn't that kind of rule out studying? Almost. We're commanded to study, show yourself, prove, and even work when you not be shamed, right? Dividing word of truth. So we're told to study the Bible. We're not told to study theology. Theology is the study of how to study topics from the Bible. It's not really about the topic that they say it is. It's the topic of the topics. And that's really what theology boils down to, the study of topics of topics. And it tries to get into the Greek idea of examining, and it doesn't even deal with the Eastern idea of approaching Scripture as it is and highlighting it and examining it as observable means to the proving thereof that it exists as it is, meaning that the premise is God speaking, and we accept that. Theology doesn't do that. He wants to tear it apart and play games with it. So when Jesus did this, and as, you were, as he was speaking to the people individually, they knew what he was saying. When you are reading your Bible, God is speaking to you directly. He is isolating you to your set of circumstances by his Holy Spirit, and he is opening your mind to understanding it by his Spirit, because it's spiritually discerned, so that it would apply to you in your day, today, as you are, where you're at, based upon your own knowledge base, whether it be high, low, medium, in between, or none at all. God, by his Holy Spirit, makes it alive to you. That's why theology is screwy, because see, theology operates within a given box and parameters. It says, these are my rules, I'm going to put God in it and examine it. Don't work that way. I'm sorry. If you like theology and you study it, you're going to get to the end of the results of theology comes to faith. Because I've taken every theologian that I know of in the world, and I say, okay, now, I'm glad that you understand all these things about the scriptures, and you say that you know this, and you say you know that. Now, what did God say to you today? Well, God doesn't speak like that. Wait a minute. Jesus said he does. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. Everywhere in scripture, it's all recorded about God speaking to people. Don't you get that? Well, that's called, and they'll give you some term, and I'll say, well, that's nice. So, you don't talk to God? Well, yeah, I do. Well, that's good. Does God talk to you? Well, and of course, they can't answer no. <laughs> so, there's usually this side topic that goes off on tangents. So, I say, okay, you know, and you let them go, and they babble and rabble and quote some, you know, theological premise they have, or else some book that somebody else has, or some other idea that they have of their popular teacher and foundational truth, which, to be perfectly blunt, there's no difference between rabbinical Judaism and theological, anybody that's a theologian, because, frankly, they're both about as profitable as, throw it away, you don't need it. God can do much better with you the way you are. It may help you, like I said, if you want to go there, fine, Solomon wanted to also. So you come out, you know, quoting Proverbs. <laughs> oh, boy. But the point is this. Your personal relationship and development of that is going to give you all the knowledge and wisdom that you need in order to apply it to the person and the individual and the circumstances of life as they work out in your life. So if you want to look at it from a cost-saving point of view, it's profitable for you to know God more than it is to study about God. Know God or about God difference between theology, relationship. Stick with your Bible, you're fine. So, 
when you confront the theologians, they'll say that, you know, and they'll get off on their tangent. And you ask them again, you know, sooner or later, and you go, so, did Jesus tell you to do this? Well, and, you know, if they're honest at some point in time, which rabbis are, you know, I can get a rabbi to admit that, you know, God didn't tell them. <laughs> at least they'll be honest. They'll say, no, God didn't tell me. Okay, that's all I want to know. You know God didn't tell you. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> You know, I mean, and I have told rabbis, seriously, when I was in the, the Messianic movement for quite a few years, I'd say, you know, I'm conversing with rabbis, and, you know, this was when Moshe was still online, alive, and when, you know, there were actually reform rabbis that were, you know, participating in these discussions on, like, AOL and different uh, faith interactive sites. You know, I'd say, hey, look, you know, I don't care what you know. I don't care what the Torah says. I don't care what Isaiah says. I don't care what any of these things say. What I care about is if you're a Jew, then you are supposed to know that God speaks. And if God will speak, then go alone, out by yourself, look up at the sky when you're alone with no one around you and ask God himself about Jesus, the Messiah. And if he doesn't answer, don't believe it. But if he does answer, deal with it. You don't have to tell me about it. I don't care. That's between you and him after that. But you got to go and get it, because if you don't got it, the rest of these Jews that we're talking to that are messianic, they got it. They are talking to God, and God is talking to them. And the funny thing is, is that, see, in Jewish tradition, you can't argue with the Jew that is talking to God. You have to either kind of like set them aside and just leave them alone to do whatever God's telling them to do, because that's a Jewish axiom. If God speaks directly to a Jew, it's pretty much treated as kind of like, ooh, you know, you, you leave them alone. You don't mess with them. You leave them out there, you know. It's not because they think they're weird or anything, but just that, just in case. <laughs> it's one of those uh, religious Jewish things, you know. It's kind of like, ooh. Well, that's the point in fundamentalist Christianity. You need to develop your relationship because if you're developing your theological premise, anybody can argue you to death. I mean, I can eat people alive for logic and fallacy and all the different presentations that people come up with in order to convince people of what they think they want them to believe at the moment that they want them to believe it, because that's salesmanship. And I hate salesmen. I even did it once when I was real young and stupid, and then I made a vow to the Lord that I probably shouldn't have made the vow because now I'm poor. But, you know, I was <laughs> making a lot of money <laughs> as a salesman. And... Uh, I sold uh, belt buckles and belts and mainly sunglasses in Southern California at a time when punk rock came in and we were selling punk rock glasses and I was selling them in like 7-Elevens and Circle K's and you know setting up the stands you know you've probably seen them they're like little short things you know with just a few glasses and some corny little you know dollar ninety nine sunglass thing you know and the one thing about Southern California is that you can always sell sunglasses because <laughs> everybody's always losing them. And we would buy them up at the you know port of uh, Los Angeles port for like oh I don't know must have been that time probably 19 cents a piece you know and then you put the little stickers on that say they were Ray Bans or whatever you know and you know you'd mark them up to sell them for 6.99 or 7.99 and you'd go into the store and you tell the person well look these are 6.99. So that's you know basically seven bucks. So we're going to give you three fifty, and I'm going to keep three fifty, you know. And then obviously it cost me sixty nine cents, so I'm making what almost three bucks off of the sale. And the guy is making three fifty, you know, and it doesn't cost him anything. All he's got to do is let me absorb the loss, set up my glasses, and I'll service them every week. As a matter of fact, I used to service them more than that. I made about a thousand dollars a week, you know, back in seventy four or five, somewhere around there, six. A lot of money for a little kid that was just, you know, kind of like hot off the block, you know. <laughs> Maybe not that much, but quite a bit of money, you know. That's all I remember is that I made a lot of money. Spent it all, because <laughs> I was backslidden. But the point is, is that in sales, I could walk in because, you know, I was a backslidden Christian, so I still had the gift of discernment. I still had these abilities that, unfortunately, I was using for the wrong reasons. And I could tell by the store owner, you know, kind of where he was coming from and I would adjust my personality in order to fit whatever that person was like, you know, and man, it was amazing. I opened up the first day, I think 22 accounts out of 22 accounts. My boss, Johnny, 
was so amazed that he made me kind of like a partner. So every day I went out and I opened up accounts. As a matter of fact, I was averaging, you know, 10 or 20 accounts per day, you know, and I didn't have an unsuccessful rate. I was 100% successful. Then I'd go back and service, you know, and just fill them up. And then when there was ever a problem, it'd send me to go in to fix it. And bingo, no problem. That only lasted for about four months. <laughs> After that, I couldn't do it. It's like one day I looked in the mirror and hated myself and said, never again. And after 35 plus years, never have, never do sales, never will, never can. So all these theologians, when they want to convince you of something, they're trying to sell you an idea. If you think of it that way, what are they selling you? You know, what is the gospel being sold to you as? Because if it's being sold to you, then it's your choice to buy it or to not purchase it. Because it's just a con game that's getting you to be convinced of something. When the reality of when Jesus said something, it wasn't to convince, it was a confrontation. It was one way or the other. There was no choice between the two. God does that with you. You don't need a theological degree in order to understand what the Word of God is. You need the reality of a relationship with Him. When God says yes, you know it means yes. When God says no, you know it means no. When God says turn here, you turn. You don't ask why. And that's sometimes what the problem is with all these major guys that get up and get out and get around and start getting into theology. They suddenly become no longer relevant to personal relationship. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, I know there's a lot of Calvary Chapel pastors that get into it and there's a lot of people that are really highly, you know, respected in the field that are theologians. And don't get me wrong, I studied too, wasted about 20 years of my life, you know, studying all kinds of things, church history, you know, and church doctrine and church this and dogma of all the different denominations that got into, you know, all these different studies that you can get into and get cross-eyed about and you kind of go, wow, I am sage. <laughs> No, thank you. I'd rather be where I'm at, who I am, little guy that I am, you know, tweaking and speaking and sharing, you know, as much as I do, with people who want to know God in a personal, intimate way. I hope you do. Because, you see, when you have one of these sticks, it really doesn't do you any good. Because the only person you should be beating it with is yourself. The Bible, more than a volume of facts, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 Charles Finney believed that the Bible teaching without moral application could be worse than no teaching at all and could result in positive injury to the hearers. I used to feel that this might be an extreme position, but after years of observation have come around to it, or to a view almost identical with it. There is scarcely anything so dull and meaningless as Bible doctrine taught for its own sake. Theology is a set of facts concerning God, man, and the world. These facts may be and often are set forth as values in themselves, and there lies the snare or the trap for both the teacher and for the hearer. The Bible is more than a volume of hitherto unknown facts about God, man, and the universe. It is a book of exhortation based upon these facts. By far the greater portion of the book is devoted to an urgent effort to persuade people to alter their ways and bring their lives into harmony with the will of God as set forth in its pages. Actually, no man is better for knowing that God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth the devil knows that, and so did Ahab and Judas Iscariot. No man is better for knowing that God so loved the world of men that he gave his only begotten son to die for their redemption. In hell, there are millions of people who know that. Theological truth is useless unless it is obeyed. The purpose behind all doctrine is to secure moral action. Moral action is determined upon interreaction with other individuals, which we used to allow for that to happen in the church because in the church we assumed that people would interrelate with each other and talk to one another 
Now with a mega church, you don't have that. You don't have people interrelating as much as they used to. With the cyber church, you don't have that interaction or that conformability to making each other accountable to one another. So there is no moral responsibility to each other to hold each other up when you fall down because you are morally depraved and you will fall down. You will make mistakes and you will create and cause errors not only for yourself but for others around you. So the church used to be the safeguard against that which now it's failed because it's no longer accountable for its members. The greatest failure of evangelical Christianity in modern 21st century is the realization that the sum total of those that are involved in ministry may not be as great as those that are sitting and doing nothing and not involved in the reality of a relationship with Jesus. They may feel conformable because of worship, but they don't feel changed morally because of message. We all have, as it were, the ability to lay down our lives individually and let God lead us responsibly if we will yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. So it is possible for a person to not be accountable to someone and be moral, but it is also the harder of the two to do because Jesus gave us each other to be accountable for each other, to be responsible to each other, to not forsake the assembling together of the brethren. So in that respect, God wants us to apply the truth of Scripture and not learn the fact of theology. Because the facts in theology are nice, but they're intellectual and you could get away with knowing it all and not doing any of it. But the reality of a relationship is that it becomes obvious by who you are and what you do, whether you have a personal relationship with someone else to be accountable to, or whether you're accountable for your actions, or whether you think you're getting away with it and you think no one's seeing what you're doing. And that final relationship that we all will have will be to stand before God in judgment, whether it be the great white throne judgment where salvation is already determined and you're being cast aside, or whether it be at the judgment seat of Christ where you're receiving rewards and works and you be cast aside possibly for not knowing Jesus or knowing Jesus because there's some there that don't get to you know kind of enter in and huh, wouldn't want to be one of those. So I guess the shtick is, what it boils down to is, intellectualism is nice. Education is good. But what will profit you has always been the scriptures as you study them, as you apply them, as you make them real in your life, and then as you involve that life with others, which is what the scriptures tell you to do. Know ye not that you are your brother's keeper? After all, for he is your keeper also. So if two walk together, how shall they walk together except they agree? But if two walk together and one fall, then the other will lift them up. So you see, there is a balance that God has for you in your interpersonal relationship with God, with Him, as you have a personal relationship, not only with Jesus, but with the people around you that may be more of a help to you than you realize.